okay so we'll start uh, with the remaining parts of the first module so as such in the last class we had uh, discussed uh, regarding the seismology uh, means as such the seismic effects and how the corresponding earthquake is generated we had also discussed the basics of earthquake uh, and as such we shall move on to the next topic how to measure the earthquakes now you see when you measure earthquake we can measure the corresponding we actually measure the vibratory motion okay and that vibratory motion as such we can measure either in terms of the displacement or in terms of velocity or in terms of acceleration okay we are measuring the corresponding earthquake at a site okay at a site so when we measure the earthquake when we measure the earthquake it will help you to understand all the parameters of that earthquake okay means uh, it will help you give you an idea of where the corresponding location of the epicenter is how is uh, how strong is the corresponding size of the earthquake these aspects can be studied based on the study of the seismic waves such so modern day instruments for measuring of earthquakes is very uh, complex as such and then they include a digital setup okay and which we have the sensors in the three directions okay uh, to measure either the velocity or the displacement or the acceleration and then you have the gps to uh, locate the corresponding location then the memory units the battery backup etc so complex system in the, the earthquake measurement instruments as such now what are the different instruments that are used to measure earthquake one as i told you we can uh, measure either the velocity the displacement or the acceleration now if you are measuring the displacements then the corresponding instrument used to measure displacements is called a seismograph okay and if you are measuring acceleration that instrument is called an accelerograph okay so as such we may be have a, either a seismograph or an accelerograph to measure either the displacement or the acceleration whether you dis measure displacement or whether you measure accelerations it will give you some input regarding what is the earthquake as, uh, size as such okay and the records that you obtain the resultant uh, what you called the graph what you obtained from a corresponding seismograph is called a seismogram and from an accelerograph it is called an accelerogram okay I, on the right hand side i had shown you a typical accelerograms of a few different earthquakes that is uh, provided by the uh, corresponding uh, journals so as such a few earthquakes has been given here and you can see all of these vibrations as such indicate the accelerations the ground motion accelerations that was observed in the accelerogram sorry in the accelerograph okay these are these graphs are called accelerograms okay and the instrument that is used to that gives this corresponding accelerograph uh, accelerogram is an accelerograph okay these are accelerograms and not seismograms okay you can either have a seismic uh, I, i think i told i shown you a figure earlier uh, in which um, you can measure either the displacement velocity or acceleration now the first we will come to seismograph okay now seismographs are generally used by the seismologists or geologists to record the arrival time of and the magnitude of the horizontal and vertical movements caused by an earthquake horizontal in the, in the sense horizontal in both directions and as well as the vertical movements of the earthquake the ad, the advantage of the seismograph is that they are very uh, sensitive okay and hence they can measure the earthquakes even that are very far away okay they are, they are very far away they can measure the, they can measure they are very sensitive and they can take up or they can uh, capture the corresponding uh, displacements even of earthquakes that are very far away okay but as such they are not very good in representing the actual shaking at a site okay because the actual shaking of the site is better expressed 
in if you are measuring acceleration okay it will give you better input or what you call a better understanding of the ground shaking okay so seismographs as such is more inclined towards geologists or seismologists and they want this instrument in order to measure or in order to determine the corresponding size of earthquake where the corresponding uh, earthquake uh, epicenter is etc it is not as such importance to be civil engineers as such because we are more concerned with the ground shaking and how the ground shaking affects buildings or structures okay so as such this instrument is primarily used by seismologists or geologists okay now what are the typical components and uh, of a seismograph okay i'm talking of a simple analog type okay i'm not talking of digital type a simple analog type seismographs has the following three components it has got a sensor a recorder and a timer okay now you see it's a very uh, simple one you see you have a uh, a pen uh, this is just an analog thing okay this was the first corresponding uh, what you call method in which seismographs was uh, developed now it has become digital now it has changed but the basic principle as such uh, uh, to explain the basic principle this figure has been given okay nowadays it doesn't mean that every seismograph is of this format okay it just uh, uh, help you understand what are the basic uh, components so it has got a sensor a recorder and a timer now a sensor as such you see you have a pen here excuse me sir yes so some students are not able to join the class because they don't have college id uh, the college id i think uh, it's easier to obtain it's not a very uh, uh, what he called a uh, tough one to obtain a college id okay i think uh, vivek vivek i know uh, vivek just uh, give the explanation i hope you are here online Okay, I think uh, Vivek will tell you later. Maybe he'll post in the group uh, how to get an college college ID. It almost uh, uh, everyone has. You have all got your college ID from a particular for means. Through a particular procedure, yeah. So the rest can also go through that procedure. Okay. Okay, sir. Because as such, if I if I use another uh, Google Drive as such, I'll not be able to record. Okay, I'll be able to give you the class, but I'll not be able to record it. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, so we'll continue. So first, you see on the right hand side, you have here a pen, okay, that is actually attached to a pendulum like this, okay, uh, with a mass here, okay, uh, a mass which is attached to a string, like it's in a pendulum. Okay? So as such, you know that when a corresponding earthquake strikes, okay, this pendulum will move, and depending upon that motion, you see the uh, drawings. Will be prepared on this chart paper here. So as such, you see, in order to uh, restrict the corresponding movement of the pendulum, a magnet has been provided, so that it it does not vibrate very large. Okay, you can get an approximate scale. Okay, uh, function of a magnet is to provide an appropriate scale, so that if the uh, in uh, the motion as such is restricted within a particular area. Okay, so that is a function of that magnet here. Okay, now you see at the this corresponding uh, uh, component, the pendulum, bob, this this one, uh, the string and the magnet. This composed of the sensor. This is what is actually the sensor part. Now the recorder is actually consists of a rotating drum, on which uh, a chart paper is rolled. Okay, a chart paper is rolled here, and the corresponding timer actually represents this rotating aspect okay this corresponding drum is rotating at a particular uh, what you called uh, speed so that corresponds to the timer okay so it's a very single 
thing uh, actually the uh, function of the magnet is just to provide a corresponding what you called restricted view like you have a damping effect that is only function of that magnet here okay so the pendulum mass the string and the magnet okay the, this mass here the magnet and the string these aspects constitute the sensor okay and just draw okay these aspects constitutes the sensor okay and the corresponding chart paper and the pen i i, I can include pen also in this the chart paper and the pen uh, includes constitutes the recorder and the drum that is rotating okay the rotating speed the rotating aspects constitutes the timer remember one thing i am talking of a a typical seismogram typical analog seismograph that is uh, uh, in this uh, that is uh, usually adopted earlier during the first initial periods of development of seismograph now it has changed a lot okay so as such if you have two such corresponding uh, uh, this corresponding instruments in two different directions and there is also a setup in order to make in the vertical direction so if you have all these three setups in one instrument it will give you the corresponding displacements seismograph measures the displacements okay it will give you the corresponding displacements of uh, what you called the earthquake the the ground shaking at that corresponding site here in the three directions x y as well as z okay so you have one setup in along x direction the other setup along y direction and one more setup you can make around the z direction okay as such these three things will constitute one instrument okay now sometimes what happens is that certain instruments as such will not have this timer part it will simply uh, show the it will continuously move <coughs> in a single plain piece of paper so that will give you the corresponding only the maximum displacement okay the maximum displacement that has occurred okay it will not give you the variation of displacement with time it will just give you the maximum displacement that has occurred so such instruments are called uh, a seismoscope okay so this is called a seismoscope in case there is no the rotating drum part okay so this is just an analog one but nowadays modern instruments are actually digital instruments and they are quite complex in construction we are not going into the uh, inner aspects of that seismograph modern day seismographs but uh, the advantage of this is that they are able to uh, magnify even uh, any motion okay since they are digital instruments they are able to magnify the ground motion to large scale and hence it's, we are able to record even the very small ground motions okay very small ground motions Okay, that ground motions as such may be either due to earthquake or it can be due to any other aspects also. For example, if a volcano happens nearby, it will cause motion. If a, uh, what is it? If an explosion occurs nearby, it will cause motion. So as such, uh, at an instrument site, the corresponding person who operates this will be able to uh, should know what are the corresponding activities are taking place near that area. So from that point of view, he will be able to say whether this corresponding uh, what you call the, the graph is of an earthquake or it is just some other disturbances that is caused nearby okay so any disturbances as such will uh, cause i mean any disturbances around the site will cause motion so as such usually the seismographs are placed in locations that are a bit remote slightly remote areas where there is no as such the disturbance of the city okay because the traffic the uh any other aspects motion uh, in construction all will cause the movement of the uh, what you call the seismograph okay it will give you readings so as such it is usually located in a bit remote location so that if anything hap if any activity happens we can identify whether it is of an earthquake or any other aspect okay now these instruments as such they have got a memory unit as i told you earlier and then that uh, corresponding memory whatever is uh readings are you obtain is stored in the instrument as such okay like digital instruments you have okay so we are not going to that aspect now in detail
now as such each there is uh, there are large number of uh, what we called seismic uh, or uh, what we call not seismic there now number of organizations which uh, both collaborative organizations as well as uh, standard organizations which uh, measure these uh, what we called uh, shakings of the earth okay so one of that uh, uh, common one is the uh, global seismograph network seismographic network which is actually a digital network consisting of uh, various sensors that are located in different parts of the world okay so in this map here uh, this is a 2009 map here you can see the locations of the different uh, what you called uh, seismo uh, instruments the seismic instruments that are placed in different parts of the country it may either be seismographs uh, uh, or some some of these may also include astrographs also okay but as such besides this each country has got its own seismographic locations besides this one okay so as such uh, of the gsm or g sorry gsn one of these locations is located here in near sri lanka okay and uh, uh, in india the as such india has its own seismographic stations as such so it is not part of this network but as such um, collaborations take place between the different uh, what you called seismic uh, collaborators and then they are able to share data in order to identify any earthquake or its magnitude etc okay the next one is accelero meter or sometimes called as accelerograph uh, both the terms are right whether you use accelerometer or accelerograph both are the same thing so so as such uh, you see I, I told you earlier that civil engineers as such we are co more concentrated not to not in the measurement of earthquake okay we are more concerned with the ground motion and what are the corresponding aspects of that motion that cause the structural damage okay and since structural damage is more caused due to the acceleration we are concerned with the measurement of acceleration and not the displacement okay so as such and here we are concerned with the measurement of only strong motions we'll discuss uh, the concept of strong motions maybe in the next lecture so as such we are concerned with the measurement of only the strong motions and hence because only strong motions are uh, cause serious damage to the structures okay so since we are measuring as such acceleration uh, these instruments the accelerometer is not that sensitive okay that may, may not be that sensitive to record the earthquake of a very what you call distant earthquake okay yeah. it is not able to as such record the corresponding um, what you called uh, mm, displacements or under displacement effects of a very distant earthquake but it can measure very accurately the ground parameters the shaking parameters at a particular site okay now there are different types of uh, accelerometers okay depending upon what is the technology used we have got potentiometric accelerometers capacitive accelerometers piezoelectric accelerometers piezo resistive accelerometers and there are large type MEMS is also nowadays very common. So as such, different uh, accelerometers as such works on different principles. Okay, uh, just to go, I'm not going the detail aspect of this part. Just go and search uh, in Google the different how they works. It is very interesting how the corresponding systems work. The thing is that uh, it, they measure the acceleration. Okay, they measure the acceleration, and all of these. Uh, some are uh, most of these are digital instruments as such so i'm not going into the detail aspects okay just go through uh, google it each of these and you'll get the approximate idea of how each of these works okay next we are concerned we'll come to the next topic is that how do we measure or how do we uh, quantify Okay, how do we quantify or how do we evaluate a corresponding earthquake? So as such, this the severity or the 
the severity of an earthquake can be assessed in two different ways. One is in terms of quantifying its magnitude, means saying that the corresponding earthquake has this much amount of energy released, quantifying the magnitude in terms of the energy released. Okay. So as such, we measure the amplitude, frequency, and location of the seismic waves. Okay, we in this aspect, what we do is that we measure the amplitude, frequency, and location of the seismic waves, and depending upon that, we come to arrive at a conclusion that this corresponding uh, uh, earthquake has released this much amount of energy. The strain energy that has been released, it is this much amount of energy has been released. That is one way of how an earthquake can be assessed. The second way is a more of a qualitative aspect. Okay, it's more of a qualitative aspect in which we measure the, uh, we don't measure, we consider the destructive effect. We cannot say it's a measurement. Uh, we consider the destructive effect of the shaking on the different people, on the structures, on the natural features. So it's more of a qualitative analysis of an earthquake. How an earthquake has affected the people, the structures, and the natural features in an area. Okay. So one is in terms of the strain energy released. Okay. The other is in terms of the evaluating the intensity. We call that term intensity. The two terms are called magnitude of an earthquake and mag magnitude of an earthquake and intensity of an earthquake okay so first we will talk about intensity now intensity as such is actually a rating of the effects of an earthquake and it has been one of the oldest methods in which we uh, we express the corresponding severity of an earthquake okay the thing is that in this corresponding assignment, you see there is no need of any instruments. Okay, there is no need of any instrumental records. Okay, and it is based on actually the observations, the visual observations or the surveys as such that has been conducted in the area. And uh, as such, you see, since it is based upon the people's observations, okay, it is highly subjective. It depends upon the corresponding mindset of the people how the uh, uh, the location aspects also has a great effect so as such you see it is based on the visual observation okay but this may be the only method for measuring the size of earthquakes of very uh, very old earthquakes so earthquakes that has occurred in the history okay in during a time when there was no such instruments Okay, when at that time, maybe long back, there may, not be, there may not be much instruments. And based upon the history, the people study the history, and depending upon the, uh, the history collected, they say, uh, they, what do you call it? They specify the intensity value of those earthquakes. Because anywhere you see the history books, as such people, if there's an earthquake, they will record it. Okay, uh, earthquake has happened here at this corresponding year. But since at that time, there was no, uh, what do you call it? instruments developed to measure the earthquake what we can do is just based on their experience based on the different records historical records we can say that this earthquake has of this intensity okay but uh, intensity also is very important because for example you see uh, a particular site as such if you study the history of that site Okay, we from the past historical records, if you study the history of the site, we may be able to get a data, we may be able to get some information of whether any earthquake has happened in that place since the data, since the history is available, since, since the data is available. Okay, data in the sense, the historical, uh, what you called uh, writings from maybe the literature or something like that. Okay, so based upon that, for very important structures, we place very important structures like nuclear plants or large dams based upon that data. 
based upon the historical records based upon the survey that was being conducted by the people especially we take the survey of people of not maybe the young age but of the older generation because they'll be likely to know if any activity has been occurred in that area so as such for large scale projects as such we take intensity data okay rather than the magnitude data since historical sorry since magnitude data may not be available okay but one thing you have to remember in mind is that intensity is not a constant okay it varies from place to place you see and the magnitude as such the amount of energy released will be constant but the intensity will not be constant the intensity will vary from place to place depending upon several factors okay one is how far the distance how far the place is from the epicenter okay how far the place from the epicenter how what are the different types of construction that has uh, what are the different types of construction that has been uh, used in that area because depending upon the type of construction some stru structures are more uh, prone to earthquakes some are less prone to earthquakes okay then the duration okay then the duration then the corresponding local aspects local uh, topographical geological these aspects okay so these corresponding aspects will affect the intensity okay will affect the intensity okay just uh, ignore this msk scape okay so these aspects will affect the intensity of an earthquake okay now the intensity scales okay as i told you are based upon the three basic features one is the perception of the people and the animals one is by looking Get, taking survey by getting the description of the people okay what has happened in that area during that uh, earthquake the other is by looking at the buildings in that area that has been destroyed during that earthquake and the third one is by looking at the natural surroundings if that corresponding earthquake has caused certain geological changes in the surroundings then based upon these three uh, things do we specify intensity okay the basic features are studying these three things okay so as such different scales has been created by uh, different persons for measuring the intensity scale two very common ones are one is the modified mercalli intensity scale or we call it the mmi scale okay very common the most commonly used the second one is medvedev spoon herak karnik or msk intensity scale this actually by three russian scientists who had uh, adopted this corresponding intensity scale so these both these scales depends upon three aspects one is what the perception of the people the performance of the buildings and the changes in the natural surroundings okay so as such we shall discuss one of these scales the first scale is the modified mercalli intensity scale earlier there was an uh, mercalli scale which was later modified so that is why we call it modified mercalli intensity scale now it was first developed by mercalli okay and then later it was uh, changed to uh, a more include more aspects so as such it has got 12 stages okay it has got 12 stages and it is based upon first the interviews okay interviews and questionnaires or questionnaires and survey interviews and survey in the affected areas and then second evaluation by experienced personnel okay one is by the interviews of the people who were living there okay and second is by experienced people who come here and who look at the performance of the buildings and who look at the corresponding changes in the natural surroundings okay so based upon this a 12 scale okay and it is given in roman numerals a 12 scale uh what you call intensity has been specified and as such based upon this 12 scale level with the one is the lowest and 12 is the highest okay and each has got certain characteristics these characteristics are given here for example if you look at uh scale number 10 okay so some we well built wooden structures are destroyed most masonry and frame structures destroyed with foundations ground badly cracked rails bent landslides considerable from river banks and steep slopes 
shifted sand and mud, water splashed over banks. So this is a description of an earthquake, of a uh, uh, description of that level 10 here. So a person as such, he goes to the site, he takes the questionnaires, interviews, and uh, experienced people come, and they look at the different things, and then they uh, finally come to a conclusion of which corresponding intensity of the earthquake had happened here. Okay, whether it is third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, or twelfth, depending upon that. So, as such, studying the corresponding uh, uh, site or the location by looking at the uh, people's uh, questionnaires, survey, and by looking at the natural surroundings, by looking at the performance of buildings, and then they come to a conclusion on of which intensity earthquake has happened there. Okay. So as I told you, intensity is different and varies from place to place. So for one earthquake, for a single earthquake, you see different locations will have different intensities. Okay. I told you intensity is as such varies from place to place. Okay. If for a single earthquake itself, for a single earthquake itself, the intensity will vary from place to place. If the place is very... Uh, at a very large distance come from the uh, epicenter, then the intensity will be less. Okay, if it is much more closer to the epicenter, the intensity will be more. So from place to place, it will vary. Okay, for a single earthquake itself. Okay, so as such, what happens is that they develop something called uh, ISO seismic. We'll discuss, come to that later. Okay, they develop certain uh, contours of the intensities. We'll come to that later. Now, the other corresponding scale is the MSK scale, okay? The MSK scale is more comprehensive compared to the, uh, the MMI scale. Why? Because uh, it not only takes into account the corresponding performance of the building, it also takes into account the type of structure much more in a greater depth and also the grade of damage, okay? A much more detailed explanation is there. Okay, which will help the people classify the earthquake or properly. Okay, so this corresponding MX64 scale is prominently used in India and most parts of Central and Eastern Europe. We use pro most probably MSK scale because it is more comprehensive. Okay, here also the uh, the stages are same. It has got twelve stages. Okay, it has got twelve stages. You can see here uh, one. Okay, from one. Okay, uh, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, till twelve here but the description are more okay more description and based upon the type of building etc a more detailed description is there for example you can see the type of structure they classify the structures type a b c okay and as such they classify not only type of structures how much damage is caused whether it is five percentage 50 percentage or 75 percentage okay and the corresponding uh, uh the classification of damage whether it is slight damage, moderate damage, this a much more detailed aspect of uh, the, uh, what do you call, of the structures, okay, has been included in the MX, MSK 64 scale, okay, MSK 64 scale. So as such, it is, uh, the things are same, there's actually 12 scales, 1 to 12, okay, but more description is given and slight, maybe slightly different from the MMI scale also, the description as such. Okay, the description will be different from MMI scale, but more aspects are involved. So I'm not going to detail aspects of this, just study, understand that there's 12 uh, intensity levels in both MMI scale as well as MSK scale, with MSK scale becoming more comprehensive compared to MMI scale. Now, besides that, okay, besides MMI and MMA, MMA there are a number of other scales also also one is that given by the japan jma scale the japan meteorological agency has got its own scale that is of uh, eight intensity levels okay and then you have an r of scale that is also commonly used okay so as such this is an, a comparison a comparison that has been obtained between the different scales okay in which you can see that the mmi and msk scale is almost similar slightly different for example here level three is slightly different as it is almost same 
for the rest jm and rf scale has their corresponding intensity levels that is been given here so this is actually a uh, what we call a comparison okay between the different scales here a comparison between the different scales here based upon the study of these different scales uh, this corresponding scale as such has been studied and compared okay so rf is also there jm is also besides these there, there are large number of other scales also but the most commonly used one are mmi and ml scale now as i told you you see the corresponding intensity of an earthquake will vary with distance from the epicenter okay will vary its distance uh, will vary from based upon the distance from epicenter and also it will vary depending upon the topological as aspects the type of soil etc uh, etc et even the uh, type of structure that has been created the uh, the type of people okay the people even it varies depending upon the people's uh, mindset to that uh, earthquake so it depends upon a large number of aspects as such so depending upon the place as such you see and an earthquake happens okay depending upon the distance from the epicenter okay the distribution of intensity the distribution of intensity at different places for a single earthquake okay the distribution of intensity at different places during single earthquake is expressed in terms of we call it as isoseismal intensity lines okay isoseismal intensity lines and these are simply the lines okay that are joining the places of equal intensity okay isoseismal lines so if an earthquake has happened here okay for example here this area will have so not here at this corresponding location here this area will have a higher intensity compared to the area beyond this compared to the area beyond this compared to the area beyond this this is for a single earthquake i'm talking about now you see you see even here you see this corresponding here it is a six level earthquake now this corresponding area is very far from this you see this distance you see it is maybe some kilometers here but these two areas are also a bit more far here but still here the corresponding intensity is higher compared to that of here here okay here it is you see it is level 4 sorry uh, ah here it is uh, level okay, ah, level 4 here and here it is level 5 here okay level 4 uh, this is eight, seven, uh, six, five, four. This green one is level four here. But you see here in these areas, it has become level five. And in between these areas, level six is also there. Okay. That means even though this area is very far from here, this look due to the topographical regions, due to the soil conditions, or due to such aspects, this corresponding area has got a higher intensity compared to the other areas, despite the distance despite the distance so that is that means that it not only depends upon the distance it also depends upon the local aspects local site conditions local uh, buildings performances okay the ground uh, type of ground type of soil etc these aspects will also come into picture okay so it's not only distance but also the local aspects okay for a single earthquake i'm speaking of a single earthquake as such So that is regarding intensity. Okay. So intensity, as I told you, is a qualitative measure. Okay. It's not a quantitative measure, but a qualitative measure of how to, to express the severity of an earthquake. The second one is the magnitude. Now, magnitude is much, much more of a direct measurement. Because here, we measure the corresponding, uh, what you call it, the seismic waves. Okay, we measure the corresponding or we study the seismic waves based upon the uh, recordings from the seismog instruments, or that may be seismographs. And then based upon that, okay, we measure the total energy released or we estimate the total energy released during an earthquake. Okay, that study is based upon the measurement of this amplitude. Okay. The amplitude of the earthquake of the seismic wave that has been recorded at the uh, seismic station okay and 
you see they take into account also the distance from the earthquake okay uh, because as such the if the distance is greater the seismic waves will die, die down okay so they will uh, estimate the approximate uh, quantity of energy released based on the study of the seismic waves and then estimating for a factor of the distance okay means how far the corresponding seismic uh, station is from the epicenter okay so de depending upon that they specify the magnitude of the corresponding uh, earthquake okay in terms of the energy released now the magnitudes are expressed as numerical values okay and are based on a logarithmic scale okay a logarithmic scale it's not a uh, simple uh, factor it's actually based on logarithmic scale and hence it has you know upper and lower limits okay so for one, for example you have a magnitude maybe one magnitude one earthquake m1 earthquake m2 earthquake m9 earthquake okay usually m8 and above it's very high okay m8 earthquake m9 earthquake means it represents the corresponding numerical value 1 2 3 4 8 etc so each increase in magnitude okay each increase in magnitude in, uh, in, when i say that there is a diff when i say m1 and m2 one increase in the unit okay actually represents almost 33 factor in energy release 10 times the fault area compared to the earlier one and the fault slip area is almost 3.3 times okay since it's a logarithmic scale okay it's m1 m2 3 4 5 is based on logarithmic scale okay so as such for each increase in unit the energy released is actually should be multiplied by a factor of 33 the fault area actually increases by a factor of 10 the fault slip actually increases by a factor of 3.3 okay uh, these two we cannot estimate it directly it is uh, much more uh, uh, what do you call uh, more what do you call it uh, um, to some uh, smaller extent okay call it smaller extent but i can say that the energy released is by a factor of 33 okay so different scales has been uh, used in order to specify the magnitudes of the earthquake okay and the four commonly used ones are the local or the richer magnitude scale given by ml the surface wave magnitude ms the body wave magnitude given by small m capital b and the moment, moment magnitude mw of which you must be very familiar with the richer scale okay in the newspapers commonly the richer scale is what is specified okay so that is more uh, common among the uh, normal people okay the richer scale it was actually uh, introduced by charles richard in 1935 based on his study on the earthquakes in california okay so what he defined that he 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 used a logarithmic scale okay to the base 10 okay and then the largest displacement means he took a standard instrument a standard seismograph called the wood anderson seismograph during that time okay the it was the seismograph used at that time so he took that wood anderson seismograph and he said that with specific properties say with properties of t time equals 0.8 and m equals m mass means m means mass 2800 and the damping of 0.8 okay the time taken the mass as well as the damping and at a distance of 100 kilometers from the focus he specified that that is m1 okay and depending on that 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 corresponding value not m1 that corresponding value taken as base he specified his logarithmic scale okay m m1 m2 m3 m4 etc okay based upon that standard instrument and standard uh, base okay so that is what richer used but uh, richer as such uh, certain developments has been made uh, over that instrument as, uh, over the uh, method of richer but as such even though in uh, advantage means even though more uh, what you called uh, updates has been made to that method it is still not a very good measure for measuring the earthquake it's not a very good uh, what you call uh, method for measuring the earthquake okay Nowadays, the corresponding, the following logarithmic form is used 
in order to express the richer magnitude scale okay that is m equals log a to the base 10 minus log a0 to the base 10 okay where a is the maximum recorded trace amplitude for a given earthquake at a distance and a0 is that for a particular earthquake selected a standard so a0 is the corresponding standard one the standard one here is this corresponding uh, standard okay so what is the amplitude of the earthquake that is located at our site minus a corresponding standard earthquake as expressed in this correspond in this corresponding instrument so taking, uh, taking the logarithmic of both if you minus this one what value we get that is the corresponding m1 the magnitude of the earthquake whether it is m1 m2 m3 etc okay uh, that uh, much more of a, a more what you call elaborate form or more, a more general form of a richer magnitude scale is also given by this equation okay we can, all these are available in standard textbooks you don't need to study these equations yes i'm telling you the aspect of that so log a by t to the base 10 plus sigma delta into h plus cr to cs this takes into account much more aspects of the distance okay the depth of the focal axis okay and any effects in the local region these aspects are also taken into account here this is much more of a, this equation is much more of a crude equation this is much more of a, a more elaborate equation in which we take for example sigma is actually the distance correction factor means the distance from the epicenter uh, distance delta okay and focal depth h it depends upon the focal it is a, actually a factor of both the distance as well as the focal depth okay the correction factor and then cr it is takes into account the regional source correction factors means for a particular region there may be certain uh, geological features that are different so that takes into aspect that cr and cs if the station has certain correction factors that is also included so as such, this is slightly a more general form of the richer magnitude scale. Okay, we're not going to more details today regarding that. Okay. Mm. So you see here, if uh, this is a corresponding, uh, what you call seismograph record of an earthquake. So as I told you, the first, the P waves will come up. Okay. Then the S waves will start coming up. Okay, and sometimes you may have after that the correspondence. You see, the earthquake study in a magnitude is based upon P and S waves. Okay, P and S waves, not the surface waves. That means we are studying the body waves here, not the S waves. Okay, and maybe a few Rayleigh waves, a few surface waves also we studied, but it's primarily based upon P and S waves here. Okay, so as such, depending upon the distance depending upon the amplitude this is a corresponding line we can develop connecting the distance the magnitude and the amplitude of a particular uh, phi m phi earthquake m phi earthquake okay but there are certain uh, disadvantages also for example, uh, the, 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 the one developed by Richard has certain frequency and distant ranges. Means it cannot be used for uh, all the frequency of the uh, earthquake and for very large distances. So certain limitations are there. So as such, when uh, you see, uh, since there's a limitation for the number of distance, means it can be measured only for distances that are less than maybe 100 or 150 kilometers. I'm not sure exactly. But if the distance is greater, then this corresponding richer scale is not useful. Okay, so a much more elaborate scales have been developed. Okay, one is the body wave magnitude scale and the other is the surface wave magnitude scale. Okay, and each of these is valid for a particular range and a particular type of seismic wave. Okay, a particular range of the distance and particular type of seismic wave. So one is the surface wave magnitude if the corresponding distances are very large okay if the distances are very large then what happens is that the body waves the p and s waves gets di will die down 
okay and the corresponding waves that gets dominated is the s waves okay so depending upon that corresponding wave surfaces or that corresponding study the surface wave magnitude ms has been developed okay and it is based upon the rayleigh waves having a particular type of time period that is 20 seconds i told you all the scales as such has a particular frequency or time range and a particular distance okay so the distance is very large what happens is that there's a chance of the body waves getting dry down because body waves are getting traveled within the body and they have undergo reflection refraction etc so it may die down by the time it reaches the corresponding uh, surface at a very large distance so for that purposes a surface wave magnitude scale is being developed Just give me a minute. Okay, so depending upon that, surface wave magnitude has been developed. Okay, and this is based upon the study of the Rayleigh waves. Okay, now the most commonly used equation is this corresponding equation. As I told you, this is also a logarithmic scale. Okay, all magnitude scales are logarithmic scales. Okay, so as such, uh, for MS for shallow earthquakes means shallow focus less than 50 kilometers. Okay, because only shallow focus waves will cause that much surface waves. Okay, and uh, it depends upon a sp specific uh, uh, records okay, between epicentral distances 20 to 160 uh, degrees and this corresponding equation has been developed where AS is the amplitude of the horizontal ground motion in micrometers deduced from the surface of the corresponding time period between 20 plus or minus 2 seconds and the corresponding delta is the uh, epicentral distance in degrees okay, epicentral distance in degrees so as such uh, this corresponding scale has been developed in order to take into account for uh, large distances. Okay. Similarly, we have the body magnitude which was developed by Gutenberg. Okay. It is usually meant for deep focus earthquake. Okay. For deep focus earthquakes, as I told you, you will not be able to get that much surface waves. Okay. So as such, it is based upon the P, PP and S waves. Okay. And it uh, the corresponding region uh, the period region varies between 0.5 to 12 seconds and this corresponding is the equation there's no need for studying the equations i'm just telling you the different uh, ways in which uh, the equation is the okay all of these are different okay the sigma and this will be different from the sigma earlier we have studied all of these sigmas will have different equations okay it's not the same everything will be different okay Okay. Now, the corresponding moment magnitude, sorry, body magnitude is over. Next is the moment magnitude. Now, it we, when we studied further, okay, when we studied about the earthquakes further, we came to understand that we know that the ground shaking, okay, the ground shaking characteristics does not actually indicate the amount of energy released. Why? Because a particular reach, uh, area, depending upon the type of soil, that uh, uh, the type of geological uh, look, uh, differences in that area, okay, certain places will can have more shaking. Okay, so as such, we cannot say that if the ground shaking is more, that means that more amount of energy is released. You cannot directly correlate as such. Okay, so as such. A more comprehensive way of outlook has been developed, okay, and in uh, this corresponding moment magnitude was uh, was theorized by Hanks and Kanamori in 1979, more recently, and then they called us the moment magnitude, okay. So this corresponding thing is much more based upon the seismic moment, okay, seismic moment due to the earthquake rupture seismic moment in the sense you see 
you have a corresponding uh, what you called rupture area okay uh, rupture area as such you see this area and this corresponding rupture area has moved by a distance say b okay so have moved by a distance say p as such sorry no, no. yeah as Sorry, sorry, one moment. This corresponding distance has moved by distance d here. Means the rupture area. You see two, two things. You see this corresponding distance between this earlier, which was one single block, entire thing was one single block. It has displaced by an amount here. It has displaced by an amount here by distance d. So as such, the energy released, the moment released, depends upon the dimensions. That is one is the corresponding how much area of rupture area has been sheared off. The second is the corresponding displacement. What is the value of displacement as such? And the third is what is the size of block? What is the size of block B? Okay, so as such, depending upon this corresponding study, uh, the value of force and moment they had specified an equation, simple equation, depending upon the value of force and moment. So as such, depending upon these studies, they gave a scale. Okay, they gave a scale MW equals 2 by 3 log M010. So instead of here, you see, instead of actually measuring the amplitude, okay, here they are looking into the moment here. In all other scales, it was actually the amplitude. But here they are taking the moment value. Okay, the moment value. So as such, uh, 2 by 3 log 10 dyne centimeter minus 16. This is what the corresponding equation they had specified. Okay. Seismologists prefer this equation. Why? Because it is it is the most most accurate among the other ones. Okay. And actually depends upon the exact uh, fault area, uh, how much uh, uh, value it has been moved, these aspects. So this is much more of a uh, actual measurement of the energy of the earthquake okay so as such this is the most commonly used among the scientific community in order to uh, specify the amount of energy released by an earthquake okay and the other scales are also used but uh, among the scientific community this is more preferred and among the people the richer scale is what usually be, uh, is common so whenever you see in uh, newspapers they will say the richest scale and richest scale m equals 2.0 it's not an accurate scale but still people prefer richest scale general people sign seismologists refer more to the corresponding moment magnitude so as such uh, we had come across almost all the four uh, types of uh, the magnitudes so as such you see all the magnitude scales whether it is ml ms and mw has gives almost similar results okay but the mb scale means ml ms and mw other than the magnitude other than the moment magnitude all other scales give almost the same value but mw or uh, small mb that is the moment magnitude gives somewhat different what we had observed is that it gives slightly different values of earthquake sizes so when you compare different scales Okay, when you compare richer scale, that is uh, uh, an M, uh, surface scale, MS or MW, when you compare all of these, we have seen that these scales, other than the moment magnitude, will have one value, almost similar value, and MB, the moment magnitude, will have a somewhat different value. Okay, that is what we had observed based upon the comparing the different magnitudes. Okay. So here, uh, that corresponding graph is also uh, shown here. You see, uh, so you can see the different magnitudes, MB, uh, ML, MJMA. MJMA is the corresponding value given by Japan Meteorological Agency. MS is there. And you see, they have a point of saturation also. They have a point of saturation also. For example, certain values, for example, here, the richer scale. Richer scale as such will saturate approximately at 6.8 here. Okay. The surface wave MS is saturates almost at uh, 7, 8, approximately 8. Okay. And MB saturates itself. Saturation is also there. 
But however, the thing is that the moment magnitude as such will not saturate. The moment magnitude as such will not saturate. So as such, it is most commonly used. Means that after a specific level, we cannot get the exact value. Means if you are measuring the earthquake richest scale, then we can specify a value up to seven. If you are specifying by a magnitude greater than seven, also it is not physically actually correct. But uh, you, you have we must have seen even richest scales are greater than seven also as such. Now, uh, as I told you, uh, the comparison between the magnitude and intensity. Okay. So as such, we know that for a specific earthquake, okay, I told you different locations will have different intensity. Okay. So that means the magnitude of an earthquake as such is a single value. Okay. It's a single value. But the intensity as such will be different based upon the location. Okay. So magnitude is one value, but the intensity depending upon the location intensity will be different. Okay. So uh, you see, uh, as such, depending upon the distance, depending upon the ground conditions, depending upon the focal depth, each of these intensity of different places will have different values. That, that is what basic understanding is. Now, intensity may only be the record available for large earthquakes in the past. As I told you earlier, in the past, okay, in the past historical records, what we know is that the people's description of the earthquake. So as such, that would be the only data that is available for us in order to estimate the size of the earthquake. Okay. So with that, we come to the end of the corresponding uh, earthquake uh, size. Now we look into the different earthquake effects. This is a very small topic. As I told you, earthquake as such has the effects of earthquake can be classified into two, whether it may be direct effects or indirect effects. The direct effects, it may either be to surface faulting, it may be due to ground failure, or it may be due to ground shaking. Okay. Sometimes it may be due to surface faulting, it may be due to ground failure, and it may be due to ground shaking. So each of these corresponding things will have an effect on the structures. Okay. So as such, the first one we shall talk is about surface faulting. Okay. Now, surface faulting is actually the differential movement of two sides of a fracture at the Earth's surface and can be a strike slip, normal or reverse uh, slip. So as I told you, due to an earthquake, what happens is that sometimes two blocks, two rock masses gets fractured or faulted. Okay, Two rock masses get fractured or faulted and this corresponding fault can either be a strike slip, it may be a normal slip or a reverse one. Okay, that uh, we had discussed all that types earlier. So as such, uh, large blocks of mass may crack and uh, surface faults may appear on the surface of the earth. This is one thing that usually happens, uh, one of the direct effects of earthquake. So even though as such, you see surface faulting rarely causes any death or injury. Okay, because as such, uh, uh, the thing is that by the time it cracks, people will move away. Okay, but what happens is that the damages to the structures will happen. The railroads, tunnels, bridges, canals, uh, drains, uh, water, yeah, means water, gas and sewer lines, this gets affected. Because this will get permanent damage. People death is rare because by the time it cracks, people will move, uh, move to safety. Okay, it's easier because it's, it, it takes place a bit slowly, but very far at a certain thing. It takes place slowly. So as such, uh, these things, uh, people may be saved, but other things such as the highways, tunnels, and these aspects will get damaged, especially if the road is passing there, the road gets damaged. Okay, sewer lines, highways, uh, bridges, all gets damaged due to surface faulting. The second is ground failure. Now, the primary form of ground failure is liquefaction there are other forms of failure also but we shall not go into that aspects okay uh, the primary form of ground failure is liquefaction so what is liquefaction you must have studied already in geotechnical uh, liquefaction as such you see especially in what you called granular soils in granular soils as such oh, when uh, a shaking happens okay the pore water pressure oozes out 
and uh, means uh, pore water pressure increases and this will result in the corresponding uh, particles to behave almost like a liquid you must have studied that one so the same thing is what is described here okay liquefaction takes place when seismic shear waves pass through a saturated granular soil okay saturated means it should have water okay saturated granular soil air result distorting its granular structure and this will result in some of the void spaces to collapse okay and the disruptions in the soil by these collapses cause transfer of the ground shaking load from grain to grain contacts in the soil layer to the pore means as such the corresponding load of the soil is transferred to the water in between the soil the pore water pressure which will increase in, which will result to the increase in the pore water pressure okay increase in the pore water pressure okay and this sudden build up of the pore water pressure will cause uh, the soil to behave in a fluid type okay for small duration okay so when it becomes a fluid type what happens is that the structures as such it will not be able to carry that load and it will uh, collapse okay this is what happens in a liquefaction generally in liquefaction now as such the liquefaction can cause three types of ground failure one is by the loss of bearing strength the other is by flow failures the third one is by lateral spreads these three are the different types of ground failure as a result of the liquefaction so result on of that fluidic nature of the soil okay of granular soil so the, if it is a loss of bearing strength okay you can see that uh, as such when the soil supporting a structure liquefies it loses its strength okay so as such what happens is that deformations it will settle up okay it'll settle up and when it settles up the corresponding structure will tip so here you can see a corresponding uh, figure here okay so as such you can see the uh, top soil the bedrock and here this is structures so the loosely packed grains are held together by friction so and pore spaces are filled with water i told you this corresponding thing will happens only in granular in saturated granular soils okay so as such when shaking happens when shaking happens the corresponding pore water pressure increases okay so as such when pore water pressure increases means uh, the seismic waves will transfer the corresponding energy to the soil the soil will transfer it to the water which will increase its pore water pressure and then the corresponding pore water pressure increase will result in this corresponding granular soils uh, behaving like a liquid and then it will a corresponding structure may either tilt or it may get settled down okay you can see the building building tilts and sinks as the soil stability declines this is actually a figure from Brit britannica encyclopedia okay the other one is by flow failures now as such what happens is that when the corresponding uh, layer of soil as such liquefies okay so as such it flows sometimes what happens is that in some areas it will not flow in some areas it will simply lose the corresponding uh, bearing capacity and the structure will sink or uh, uh, deform very largely or tilt but sometimes what happens is that the entire a layer of as such instead of uh, uh, a liquefied layer of soil will move over another layer of soil okay so you have one layer here and you have another layer here so this corresponding layer at the top gets liquefied and this corresponding layer will move Okay. and it is the most catastrophic form of failure because it will affect a large areas okay this as such this corresponding thing will be much more of a localized uh, thing okay and uh, all the buildings may not tilt because it depends upon if the structure is very heavy then it may cause serious deformations if the structure is not that heavy that it may sustain only minor damages but this what happens is that entire thing moves out so including the foundations entire thing will move out and entire structure will be like almost like washed away that form of uh, uh, what you called like a landslip like, like a landslide that form of behavior okay that's actually not caused due to the landslide but it's actually caused due to the liquefy means the liquefying of the soil okay and the third one is the lateral spread okay the lateral spread is also similar to the corresponding uh, what you called uh, flow failure but the thing is that here a certain blocks gets formed okay 
a certain blocks gets formed and the soil will move in certain blocks laterally move certain blocks so you can see here so as such this also as such will not cause that much damage compared to the flow failures okay that he since this block is uh, intact this block is intact as such you may there, there may be slight cracks ruptures within the block but as such one block will be intact so only the corresponding structures which are there at the edge of two blocks will get damaged rust will almost retain even though there will be damages but it will retain the structure to some extent so that's called lateral spreads so three types of uh, uh, failures due to liquefaction liquefaction is of primary concern okay in among the ground failure okay. the third one is the ground shaking okay so ground shaking everyone is familiar with so as such when a corresponding building shakes okay corresponding building shakes due to that shaking aspect the entire structure may either get uh, damaged uh, uh, it may collapse or it may get seriously damaged okay so uh, the shaking may as such may be either very small okay depending upon the uh, magnitude of the earthquake depending upon the distance from the epicenter it may either be very small or it may be very violent okay you see the ground shaking actually causes the destruction of property okay it does not actually cause direct loss of life but the destruction of property will result in the destruction of life loss of life okay for example if you if the corresponding building shakes okay the masonry will get damaged okay masonry the first one which gets damaged so when the masonry falls on people people will die okay or people may be thrown out of the corresponding uh, structure such thrown out its very chances less usually the collapse of the structure or collapse of any components of the structure it may be collapse of a masonry wall or some other fan or whatever the ceiling roof whatever it is as such the collapse it, people's death occurs only when they are within a structure that is why we, we say that when an earthquake happens try to get out of the house why because and to stay away from other structures because the loss of life due to the ground shaking is actually due to the destruction of the property as such so ground shaking is another direct effect of the earthquake besides this there are number of indirect effects like uh, as you know that earthquake cause tsunamis we have already uh, uh, experienced tsunamis during earthquake then we are landslides can occur floods can occur even forest fires as a result of uh, earthquake can occur due to the uh, what you call maybe uh, loss short circuiting or the disruption of these power lines power grids etc even fires are common okay these are the indirect effects okay and as such they may either act separately or they may in combination with other damages they may as such increase the damage of an earthquake okay so this is a brief outlook of the different earthquake effects and we shall study more about the ground shaking aspects later okay when we discuss the ground motion aspects okay in the next lecture we shall study more about the ground shaking aspects because ground shaking as such also depends upon a large number of factors we'll discuss that later now we shall come to the last topic of this uh, uh, presentation it's actually the seismicity of india now i told you earlier that uh india as such comes under the indo australian plate okay in the northeast western part of the uh, end of the indo australian plate i think we had discussed that uh, uh, we have seen about that corresponding plates earlier okay so as such what happens what due to the corresponding push of the indo australian plate uh, to the eurasian plate the indo australian plate is actually getting subdued going under the eurasian plate is going under the eurasian plate this is the corresponding boundary what you see here is the boundary here okay this is the in the australian plate this is the eurasian plate okay the himalayas has been formed due to the subduction of the indo australian plate under the eurasian plate so you can see the himalayas in this region okay it happens in this region now this is the basic tectonic this one as such the india is such divided into a number of sub 
regions, subtectonic regions. One is the Himalayas. Okay, that is caused due to that subduction part. Okay, the subduction of the indo australian plate to the Eurasian plate. The other is the the plains. Okay, the plains you have the indo ganges plain at this end. Okay, also you have certain other plains that is due to the rivers here. So you have the Narmada plains here, you have the Mahanadi plains here, the Godavari plains here, which are more prominent. There is actually a, a, a line like this uh, uh, along the Narmada plain. Okay, we, I'm not going to that aspect detailly. I'll show you in the next uh, next part. And the next, it is the peninsular India. The peninsula region consisting of the other areas. So these are, these are the sub tectonic regions or sub regions in within the uh, Indian country as such. I'm not going to the detail aspect of the study of this. It's a too much. Uh, uh, it's a different topic as such. Okay. So depending upon this corresponding study, the seismicity of India can be divided into a number of groups. One is the Himalayas. Okay, Himalayas at this corresponding region. Okay, and then you have the Andaman Nicobar that is not shown here. Yeah. And then you have the Kutch region and the peninsula. Kutch region is actually the region remaining the all other parts. Okay, other than the peninsula region. And then you have the peninsular part here also. Peninsular region also. You can this is what I call the Narmada Son lineament. Okay, it's actually across the Mahanadi, sorry, uh, Narmada plains, this corresponding line. Okay, here you have the corresponding Mahanadi Graben, which is along the Mahanadi Plain, and here you have the Godavari Graben, Godavari Plain, and here also you have a few Kaveri one also, which were not that much prominent. Okay, as such, no, no need of going to this, these aspects. There is no need of study of these aspects. Now, these are the different earthquakes that has happened in India during the last uh, maybe ten. Uh, hundred years as such so as such uh, the different locations of these earthquakes and their and their magnitude sizes has been uh, given in this figure here okay uh, as such uh, the last most uh, what dangerous uh, earthquakes you see some earthquakes has got very high magnitude but as such uh, it may the life of property may not be that much because it may be far away from the what you call uh, from the land mass. So that also happens. Okay. It doesn't mean that everything. The, uh, the most dangerous ones in the uh, recent history is the one in the Gujarat, which we had experienced. And commonly in Jammu and Kashmir, we had a few uh, serious earthquakes of a uh, grade. This one. Rest all, uh, uh, most of the earthquakes, you, see, you can see it is in the Himalayan region as such. Okay. Himalayan region. And a few. Earthquakes, interplate earthquakes are also there, but are comparatively lesser, less than we see five or six magnitude. Okay. Uh, one one you see is al along this plane, along the Narmada plane here. You have a few earthquakes here also, and then as such, oh, these are the major ones. And you have a number of earthquakes in uh, Pakistan also that we are not taking into account right at the time now. So you can see here the list of some of the recent earthquakes that has occurred okay. a few uh, later than 2015 are not taken into account this is actually the thing by from the bmtpc uh, notes so that thing has been accounted for now the, as i told you we already know about the different uh, seismic uh, earthquakes the earthquake that has happened in the past we know about the corresponding tectonic activity. So depending upon that, we had uh, divided the country into a number of zones. We call it seismic zones. Okay. So as such, uh, the designing of structures, okay, actually depends upon if we, uh, these seismic zones. Even though we may not be able to possibly predict an earthquake, means when it will happen but to some extent depending upon the tectonic study depending upon the study of our place depending upon the study of our sub regions we have divided our country into a number of seismic zones okay a number of seismic zones a seismic zone is actually a map okay a seismic map where the entire country or region is divided into a number of uh, zones of a particular probability risk we call it a seismic 
probability or seismic risk okay a country or a region is divided into certain zones depending upon the seismic risk okay and that seism this corresponding division will help in the implementation of this code provisions especially for earthquake resistant design okay but the seismic zones as such is more of a broad based division okay so as such local variations especially in local variations in soil type the geology as such cannot be represented to that scale okay the local variations especially in soil type and geology cannot be represented as such so for simple structures for simple buildings basic simple structures as such if you know the zone seismic zone of the map we will design our structures based upon that zone okay means greater the uh, uh, means certain zones will have higher probability risk so our structures will have to incorporate more better features okay certain regions will have a lower probability risk so as such very uh, large what you called uh, uh, earthquake resistant features need not be included so it depends upon where the corresponding building is located but what happens is that as i told you local variations can occur so very major projects such as dams nuclear projects etc these things while while we uh, design it we also take into account the local variations okay we means not take into account we should take into account in other structures also but a more detailed study will be conducted a more detailed study will be conducted so that the, these structures for example a nuclear power plant a damage of nuclear power plant will damage of nuclear power plant or a dam will create large destruction of prop, uh, property and life so for that yeah, study for that structures or for that buildings or for that constructions we study about a region into a greater depth so we we just not only rely upon the seismic zones we rely upon proper further studies in order to design such structures okay now as such based upon the intensity levels okay uh, our code bis bureau of indian standards has prepared certain maps and these maps get revised from time to time okay the first seismic map was created in 1962 okay the, the first seismic map zone sorry zone map not this map the first seismic zone map as such was uh, created in 1962 by bis before that also we had a few maps but after the establishment of bis the first seismic zone map came in 1962 and then in 1967 we revised it and then in 1970 again we revised it uh, as such in the 1970 version we had five, uh, six five zones 1 2 3 4 and 5 then the latest revision was in 2002 okay in which uh, we now we have only four zones okay zone as such zone 1 has been deleted and both zone 1 has been included Uh, in the zone to itself okay so now we have four zones okay is actually the zone is based upon the intensity study okay uh, the zone as such is, is based upon the intensity studies so zone 2 3 4 and 5 this is the actual uh, corresponding uh, zones as per uh, our uh, code bis code so you can see zone 2 3 and 4 5 here so as such this is the seismic zone map you can see here okay so as such you can see the himalayan regions are in zone 5 zone 5 is very high risk zone okay means it can have a shaking of intensity in line and more above okay intensity of shaking we have a intensity level up to 12 okay so a nine level intensity shaking is possible in these corresponding things you see actually the, this corresponding damage you see uh, earthquake occurred in 2001 okay in gujarat so as such this corresponding map was revised after that and hence this aspect has also been included in the zone 5 so as earthquakes happen these maps we will revise it okay based upon further tectonic study we will revise it okay so earlier this zone 5 was not there in gujarat but after the 2001 uh, earthquake the gujarat earthquake in gujarat this aspect this zone 5 was included here in this area okay it doesn't mean that it is just just because an earthquake has happened it means that this is zone 5 no it also depends upon the tectonic study also okay and then zone 4 uh, high risk zone okay this very high risk zone 4 is high risk and zone 3 is moderate risk and zone 2 is 
uh, lower. Okay. So as such, these are the zone maps. You see, Agra will come approximately in zone three, uh, zone three, zone three, zone two region. Okay. So uh, as such, by studying the corresponding different zones, when a structures are de designed depending upon which zone it is located, means how much earthquake resistant features need to be incorporated. That depends upon the in which zone a structure is located. Okay. Okay. So as I told you, uh, seismic zones gets revised from time to time, depending upon our understanding of the geological aspects, the seismic tectonics and the seismic activity in the country. So that means that the latest version, 2002 version is not the final word. Okay. Modifications will emerge as new earthquakes happen. Uh, modifications will further uh, happen in the map so it gets revised from time to time so with this we come to the end of uh, this correspondence